Welcome to the Rick Elps Real Estate Show today. Special guest, Joanna Allhands. Welcome. You are the Opinions Digital Editor for the Arizona Republic, correct? I am. And you and thank have you for done, having me. Oh, thank you for coming. You, uh, you've done extensive research on Arizona water. And uh, um, so I'm going to start out real quick for the people that can't stand to watch me for more than a minute. I'm just going to jump in both feet and say, are we in trouble? No, uh, not immediately. And, you know, as it is with real estate, everything in water depends on location, location, location. There are some places in the state that do have some very real problems that need to be addressed. And, you know, we're going to have to deal with that. Um, are there places where probably you're going to be fine? Yeah, there's those two. So it really just depends on where you're at. Well, I see, whether or not you're um, in trouble. you know, I've seen and have been told that, you know, that housing takes up less water actually than agriculture. Uh, if you put yes. in a tract of homes where there were farms, you're using less water. But there's also a um, um, some cutbacks coming for places like associations that they have to reduce their water usage by 30 to 40 percent in effective in January, which will make them do more desert scape instead of green belts. Is that uh, is that coming? Like here in Arizona? I, yeah. I know that's definitely been something, you know, that California has looked at. They've created all these water budgets for different cities. And actually, they just recently put those kind of on hold because they realized, wait a second, this is going to be a huge lift that we're maybe there's better ways to do this that aren't going to be quite so costly. Um, you know, I haven't heard that there are mandatory, you know, 30 percent kind of cuts anywhere uh, in, in Metro Phoenix. Uh, I mean, maybe I just haven't, haven't heard of those, but, um, you know, that's certainly, I haven't heard anything that's mandatory coming down the pike for us just yet. Yeah, I don't, I don't think actual, that that all. Yeah. I don't have the actual number, but, um, so I've flown over Lake Mead and, uh, and I can see that we're running out of water. Um, but we get most of our water from underground, don't we? Well, it, it depends. It depends on where you are. It gets, it gets back to that whole part of location, location, location. Some places are very highly reliant on the Colorado River and, and the water from Lake Mead. Other places only get their water from groundwater. And it really depends. Even here in Metro Phoenix, just the uh, percentages of water in each city's portfolio actually vary by quite a lot. You know, Scottsdale relies pretty heavily on the Colorado River, uh, you know, whereas a place like Tempe really does not so much. So it really, really depends. And then, you know, there's other places like, you know, Buckeye that really don't get much Colorado River water at all. They're, you know, very highly dependent on groundwater. So it, it depends on where you are. Well, you wrote an article in January and uh, I'll pull it up here real quick. And it says here, uh, a quiet water deal paves the way to build thousands of homes in Arizona. Um, was there a, um, tell me what that's about. Well, so that was in Pinal County. And so there was a deal to uh, be able to get some water from the Gila River Indian community um, and to be able to use that for housing. Um, and so it's, it's a big deal. Um, it could be, you know, potentially a, a big, uh, you know, thing that maybe some other developers could use, but really, you know, it's that deal is really heavily dependent on come back to it again, location, 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 you know, uh, the, the water and where it's stored and where they would be getting that water and, and how you move it around, uh, you know, to to get it to the homes that would be needed. It's not really something that would work for a place like, you know, Buckeye, because they're very far away from uh, the Gila River Indian community and where that water is stored. But, you know, in this case, for this development, um, you know, it 
it could actually, and we'll see actually, I mean, it's really just sort of an option for them to acquire the water, whether they do or not will be, you know, that will be the telling case to see if they, if it really works out in, in the, uh, you know, market sense and, and makes dollars and cents sense. Well, some of the misinterpretation of the news, that, which is really easy these days, um, they, when the when the governor said that uh, she was going to um, limit new permits to developers that could show that they had a 100 year supply of water because there was a report that was out there that said that our estimates are showing that we're going to be 4% short of our 100 year supply. And so right away, the headline says, governor stops new development, which really, that wasn't even was close not, to what she did. No. <laughs> uh, she just said, no. again, I want to reiterate that you need to show that supply. Now, I asked that and say, when I look out to Apache Junction, where there's not been any farms and it's just desert, and they're on paper, they've got this huge development going out there, uh, will they have water? Well, they're going to have to prove it, aren't they? Um, you know, yeah. that is what the law is about, to be able to get a certificate of assured water supply, which is required in the Phoenix Active Management Area, which is part of uh, where we all are. Uh, you know, you have to prove that. And so you can do that in one or two ways. You can either get a certificate of uh, assured water supply, which is for people who uh, like, you know, developers who maybe are not joining a, uh, you know, like a municipal or a privately owned water uh, provider, um, or you can, or you can just, you know, get a commitment from a designated water provider uh, to be able to provide service for you. And so, you know, anyone that's in a designated area, any construction can, can continue there. Uh, and for certificates, that's the thing. If they're coming in and they're saying we only have groundwater, they can't build with that on a certificate right now. Um, so they're going to have to come with something else. If they already have a certificate, you know, and some of the developments out there in AJ, you know, I, I think those do already have their certificates. Um, you know, they've already proven under the rules uh, that were there at the time that they had the water. So that's the law. That's, that's how it goes. Well, well what's, what's with the quirky, uh, uh, exception where you don't have to uh, have, um, proof of water for build to rent communities. Right. Because state law talks about, you know, it's only for subdivisions and subdivisions are defined as, uh, you know, lots of um, six or more. And so it also has an exception for um, anything that is rented. It's not considered part of that stipulation. So, I mean, there's lots of, there's legislation that is in uh, the legislature right now trying to work through some of those things. Uh, as I've heard, it has stalled. <laughs> so we'll see um, what happens there. There's actually a couple of different versions of build the build to rent uh, legislation that's trying to go through. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll have to to see how that goes in the legislature right now. I also heard uh, at the forum that you and I were at where a gentleman got up and said that 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 report that said we were going to fall four percent short of our hundred year goal was not entirely accurate because it wasn't taking into consideration replenishment. In other words, that, that is water the, that we've treated and put back in. And so. Well, and I think there is some of that built in and, and keep in mind, it's a model, right? Yeah. And so models, um, the saying about models is they're good to prove wrong, <laughs> right? It's, <laughs> it's basically just showing under a set of, uh, assumptions where we're at at this point in time. It, it's not, you know, necessarily looking forward. So, you know, it, it also doesn't model in what could potentially happen with the Colorado River, uh, you know, in the future. So it's really just showing where we're at at that point in time. And it showed, you know, that there are some places where the amount of water would not be available to um, you know, 
handle their 100 year needs. Um, so, I mean, it's it's not necessarily um, it's not necessarily something that is going to be accurate 100 percent because it's just showing a, a point in time. Kind of like our real estate predictions. <laughs> right. So so it it uh, um, you know, I hear we're using actually less water now than we were in the 1950s, uh, but it's really hard to wrap your head around that when you look at just how many homes are are here and how fast we're growing and all of the multifamily homes that are being built, all the apartment complexes and the like. And you just have this feeling that we've got to be stressing out the system, are we not? Well, that, and I'll come back to the thing that I said before, it depends on location, location, yeah, location. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there is this big misnomer, I think, that, um, you know, if we just automatically have more people moving here, that we're going to be using more water. And, you know, historically, that has not been the case. If, uh, you know, new homes are displacing, you know, farmland, because as you mentioned, you know, farmland is more historic, tends to be more of a water intensive use, um, you know, you're going to be using less water over time. Um, and so, you know, it really depends on where new building is going. Is it going in places where we're displacing something that was already a more water intensive use? Or, uh, you know, is it going out on raw desert, um, you know, and being built? And I know, I mean, you know, definitely the home builders often, uh, you know, argue that, well, but we're, even if we are building out on raw desert, you know, we are replenishing that. And they are, they are replenishing up to their allowance. They can still pump some water, uh, but they do replenish anything that they pump above the groundwater allowance that they're given. Now, out in the alfalfa areas out by the Colorado River, uh, they are not renewing the leases of these big uh, foreign-owned farms that were drilling down about 1,500 feet and using all this water for alfalfa and shipping the alfalfa to the Middle East. Um, do you see that having much of an impact out there? and Or will those alfalfa farms just be replaced with somebody more local growing alfalfa again? Yeah, well, and I think that's the thing, um, you know, and, and I think this is the big misnomer about that whole situation. The leases that were canceled were only in the Butler Valley groundwater uh, basin. And so, you know, it matters definitely for Metro Phoenix uh, because that basin is one of several basins that had been set aside many, many years ago as transportation basins. So yeah, the Butler Valley Basin is a transportation basin, which means that, uh, you know, cities in Metro Phoenix and, you know, also, you know, potentially uh, Pinal County and Tucson could tap that basin and pump some of that water for future needs. And so I think that was the big concern with Butler Valley is that, uh, you know, you had a farm there that was using that water. They're basically the the main uh, water user in that basin. There is a little bit of cattle grazing, but not very much. It really was mostly them. Now, keep in mind, you know, and there is definitely plenty of discussion about whether the governor intends to cancel the Saudi leases uh, in other basins that they have, but they haven't yet. It really, the only ones that they canceled were in that Butler Valley Basin. And, you know, I think that that was the right decision not because it was the Saudis that were there, but just because we shouldn't have had a farm there in a basin that was set aside for better or worse for transportation purposes. So, you know, there's that. But I do think that there is this big misnomer about how much impact the Saudis are having on water supplies. Now, make no mistake, the pumping that they've done in places, you know, near Salome and Vicksburg and that sort of thing, you know, people are complaining and saying, since they've moved in, they've put in a really deep well, and now I'm going dry. That's a problem. However, if you look at, in total, the amount of um, alfalfa that they grow, and just in 
with all of the other alfalfa that is grown in Arizona, it's actually about 10% is what gets exported. It's not that much. Most of the alfalfa, the lion's share of the alfalfa that's grown in Arizona goes to dairies in Arizona, which most of those dairies produce milk and cheese and other products for Arizona grocery stores. So, you know, I mean, most of the water that we use to grow alfalfa actually stays here in state. You know, we can definitely have a discussion about whether, you know, we should allow foreign entities to do that, to be able to pump water and grow alfalfa and export it. Um, you know, but I think it's definitely been much more overblown as, you know, what kind of impact it's having. Is it having an impact on some people locally? Yes. Is it completely bankrupting the state? No, there's actually quite a bit of other activity that's happening. And so they're just really a small part of it. Well, you also had another article that came out that said, if Arizona's water supplies are dwindling, why don't we just cut off the growth? And well, I wasn't saying, say, yeah, I, I wasn't saying we should. I was saying, no, that's no, that was just a question. topic that's, you know, should Arizona's yeah. water be cut off to save water? And so you, yeah. you addressed this, this topic and saying, you know, it's, in it, you can either be pro-growth, uh, which apparently now means that we should build whatever without regard to how to use water, or you can be anti-growth. And you're saying, well, there's easily a balance to be achieved, right? Right. I think that's the debate, right? Is a lot of people talk about this as if it's in absolutes. And that's how it is with a lot of things in water. Everybody wants this to be a black and white, it's right or it's wrong kind of thing. And really when you deal into, get into the you know specifics of things, it's really actually much more muddled than that. And so, you know, it's not a, a question of, do we have to completely cut off growth or do we just let everything go willy nilly and, and you know, not, do anything at all. I think really the answer is in the middle. And that's where the debate needs to be. It needs to go into the middle of, no, we need to still have growth. You know, we still need to have an economic base. We still need to have, you know, additional things coming into our community. That's a good way to, you know, ruin the quality of life for everyone that's here is if we aren't continuing to grow economically. Um, so we do still have to do that. But we need to do it wisely. We need to make sure that whatever comes here, it's got the water. And, you know, that's why the assured water supply and, and all the other, you know, rules that we have for groundwater management in Arizona are important um, because that's what they're set up to do is to make sure that people can prove that they've got the water to sustain themselves. Um, you know, and there's definitely there's definitely uh, loopholes to that, of course, you know, as we were just talking about with some of the other things like, you know, apartments that could could build or or, uh, you know, uh, any sort of uh, industrial kind of thing that can sort of get around that. Um, and those are things that need to be addressed. But the rules that we have, you know, are important. They're there for a reason. Well, I think that for people that don't know, you know, a lot about Arizona and that are kind of looking from afar, um, um, they need to know that Arizona and Nevada do an excellent job of managing the water supply. It's not just go get it. It's there. We'll address it down the road. It's, it's monitored. It's managed. It's recycled. It's, you know, I mean, we've done a great job in this state of making sure that we have, we have water. Yes. In in urban areas, I think that's the the big thing, you know, <laughs> coming back to the thing that I keep saying over and over again about location, 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 you know, the Groundwater Management Act of 1980, you know, really only addresses urban areas. And the goal when that was passed was never just to keep it at that. It was supposed to be, well, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about how we manage groundwater in rural areas, because really right now, the only rule that there is in rural Arizona is he who has the deepest well wins, which is why you're seeing stories about, you know, people who somebody comes in and drills a deeper well next to them and suddenly they're out of luck. You know, that's just how it is. And it really shouldn't be that way. Right. Cause that's not, that's not fair. And it's, it's not good for Arizona to have 
that persist. Yeah, um, we've seen a lot of that going on up in the uh, pine and strawberry area. Wells well, going a couple summers ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and the the problems are complicated up there too because it's not like you know farming farming isn't doing that. It's just they've got a system that was cobbled together over many years. Um, really, a, it 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 leaks like a sieve. Um, it's it's not a, a good system at all. And uh, you know the, these poor folks are trying to manage this thing as best as they can with a limited customer base. So they really can't do what they need to do fully to fix the leaks. In addition to the fact that you know the the their will what they're having to drill wells that are super super deep. Um, and maybe they're not always that productive. They're really just fully reliant on groundwater. And honestly, they've just got this influx of, um, you know, a bunch of Airbnbs and that sort of thing that are taxing the system beyond what it was designed to be when they're there in the summer. So, you know, that's, that's the problem in, in strawberry and pine. It's not so much, you know, this, this agriculture question, it's more, you know, we've got a system that's just subpar and uh, we, we don't have the resources to be able to fix it. Yeah. And that's expensive. And you're just up there with a few houses and you can't just up your Airbnb rates to, uh, to put in a new water system. So they're between a rock and a hard place up there. And, and uh, yeah. I think, believe that Prescott was having problems for a while too, a few years ago, weren't they trying to cap growth because of water up there? There was a lot of talk about it, definitely. Um, you know, and the whole question up there is, you know, are they going to, are they not going to chat, tap the big Chino? Uh, you know, what's going to happen there and and how would that affect the, the Verde River, which, you know, supplies a decent amount of water to us here in, you know, Metro Phoenix as well. Um, it, it's, we'll see what happens up there. I think it's, it's, it's to be determined as to whether or not things are going to go horribly wrong. Well, you follow this very closely and I know you do uh, write a lot of articles where, uh, where can we follow your work with just the Arizona Republic online? Yeah, you can get there at all hands, uh, dot dot com. So a L L H A N D S dot A Z com And That'll take you to uh, all my recent stuff. Well, that's great. Again, I appreciate you coming on the show and clearing that up for us and uh, letting people from out of state know that, you know, it's look, it's not as bad as you're hearing. It's uh, it's being managed. It's, uh, you know, 100 years from now, it looks like we still have water. Doesn't mean that on the 100 and year 101, we're out. Um, it's being it's being carefully watched and managed. So there's nothing to panic about. And uh, so I appreciate you coming and adding that and answering some of the questions that, that we have. And I hope I can have you back on again sometime. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Thanks, Joanne. Thank you. It's official. We have one in the can. <laughs>